Kia ora koutou katoa, uh, nau mai koutou, nau mai tātou, uh, ki naro i ngā parira o Tararua Maunga e Tumaira, uh, ki ngā tahataha o Wairarapa Moana e karekare maira, o tira nau mai tātou ki pai tu mōkai, ki ona hapū, mana whenua, ki ona iwi. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Um, I can see many friends and neighbours from, from Featherstone and Wairarapa, um, and you may recognise me as somebody from North Featherston, or as we like to refer to it, Papawai. <laughs> the capital of this sort of small outpost that you fellas started, about three kilometres outside of Papawai. Um, our locals, uh, the Booktown trustees, Booktown organisers, community of Featherston, community of Wairarapa, on our collective behalf, um, I, I just want to extend another warm welcome to our, our guests and our experts who have come from all over the country to be here with us this afternoon. And also a massive welcome, a big welcome to everybody amongst you that's travelled to be here uh, from near and far. Can, on behalf of all of us from Wairarapa, we extend a, a, a very warm welcome to you all. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou. Um, when you, we, we did our karakias last night. Me and Tamui were up milking the cows this morning at four and we did some more karakias. <laughs> You're not even supposed to put an S on the word like karakia, you get in trouble for that. Um, but we, um, we, we, it was a great pleasure to host uh, these folks. To Māori, just mihi to you, uh, Ngai Tuahuriri. Um, there's connections between Ngai Tahu's, uh, uh, to iwi Ngai Tahu, strong connections to us here in the southern part of Wairarapa. But we got to host um, the crew here out at Papawai just this morning. And it was a real pleasure to, on our collective behalf to share something of place and people with them, um, to make them uh, have a sense of where they are and who we all are. Um, I, I'm not going to say much, but I'm going to say some, just a few words when you've when you got the microphone, you can't resist it. Um, so there won't be another karakia, we did that last night, but I will leave you with some ancestral words of wisdom for them, for them and, and for us, and then we're going to hand over to Shane to, 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 get, to get started. So those of you that are locals will know that the marae at Papawai, uh, which is the place where our mana whenua hapu of the South Wairarapa uh, come together and do our things, was the, the physical base of the Kotahitanga Māori Parliament movement of the late 1890s. So it's a, you know, for us local people, it's a significant and important place. Uh, that word Kotahitanga means unity, and it was the banner that they all uh, rallied under for the important uh, issues and kaupapa of the day at Papawai. It was a pleasure to share with our panellists, um, uh, there's one particular image uh, where the old folks are standing in front of their Māori Parliament building at Papawai and they're flying a union jack and there's a sort of a tension in there and it's the very same tension that we're going to be covering off today. They are, um, they've chosen to, be, to fly that particular flag, the flag of Kawanatanga, but they're doing it standing in front of doing it standing in front of their own whareanui, their own Māori parliament, which is the, so the flag is the, is the, kahu, the kawanatanga part of it, but the whareanui is the tenoranga tiratanga part of it, for those of you who know what those words mean. Just looking across our room, I suspect, uh, Shane, there's going to be people at all sorts of kind of levels and dimensions of the dialogue that we're about to, about to have. But really, the, the question, as a, for me as a local person, and it's a question that these guys are going to touch on, how can or should rangatiratanga and kawanatanga coexist? In, in, and that is the thing that makes Aotearoa New Zealand different from everywhere else in, in the world. And then the build-up for, for today in the, in the advertisements, how might that, what kind of ruler do we have for knowing if that is working well? And in the, the marketing materials for this session, there's a bit of the ruler. It said, how would we do that in te tiriti, in treaty honouring ways? I have a daytime job in the education system and the Education and Act says there's about a whole lot of purposes for the education system, teaching people reading, writing, etc. But one of the purposes is to do the education business in te tiriti honouring ways. Moana and I have a friend in common, we used to be in a band together with him, who's finally got a serious job, he's a Supreme Court Justice, and, and I rang him up mate and I said to him, hey mate, what does the word honour mean in a legal sense? And he's a bit cheeky, as you know, and he said to me, I don't know, I'll tell you if you ever appear in front of me. <laughs> I was saying, well, what the hell use are you to me? 
But then, because you have to be clever to be on the Supreme Court, right? He says, why don't you education people go and ask the mana whenua people what it would look like to them if it was te tiriti honouring? And I think that's really part of the answer, eh? We, we have to have a dialogue. We have to find time to talk to each other and say... Shane, Shane. Shane. Dude, talk to... Is he, is, he, is he cutting me out? Turn your microphones this way. He's saying, hurry up. Thank you, Moana. She knows how it works. <laughs> It means we have to actually have a dialogue. We actually have to find time to say, what would it look like if it was te tiriti honouring? I can see some of our representatives from local council here. So what would the relationship between Papawai Marae and South Wairarapa District Council look like if it was te tiriti honouring? I can see education leaders here. What would the relationship between mana whenua and Featherston and Featherston School look like if it was te tiriti honouring? And being honouring is probably not a static concept. It's probably going to change over time. And that might be the most, the very, very most important thing. What would it look like in 20 years' time, and 40 years' time, and 100 years' time? And what, how do we know? How will we keep checking in on it? Because it will look different. It will look what was treaty honouring in 1980 looks very different from what's treaty honouring in 2023. And that's, I think, actually the most important thing. I'm, I've heard a young fellow, Ed, the guy Kapakingi, Eddie, uh, one of the Kapakingi boys from up in the far north, say. We have to be, I wrote it down to make sure that I get it right. We have to be, think like, te, we have to be tipuna, think like tipuna making mokopuna decisions. Think like ancestors making grandchildren decisions. So in terms of ancestry, the words I want to leave you, three words, to to give a bit of support and top cover for our panel here, because this is hard, right? Hard it all. Three words from Wairarapa. Tui tui tangata. Tui tui korowai. It's one of our whakatauki here in Wairarapa. Wairarapa people, I'm sorry, you fellas know lots of my materials. Tui tui means to weave, and tangata means people. So weaving people, tui tui tangata, is like tui tui korowai, weaving a korowai, a precious garment. The master, sorry, the expert weaver, she has a picture in her mind of what good looks like before she just goes and weaves something. She's got to know what good would look like. And then she assembles all the parts, and then she executes the weave with real precision and real care. And at the end of it, she'll produce a garment, a taonga, that the whole village will be proud of. Shane's going to be the weaver for this panel, and we are confident that this session will be produce a taonga that we're all proud of. Featherston Booktown has woven this event together, and it feels like something, Featherston people, we can all be proud of. But the big conversation is, how do we approach this conversation with the care of the expert weaver to make sure that the taonga that we produce out of this discussion, that for Aotearoa, is something that we are not only proud of, but future generations are proud of, and the whole world looks at Aotearoa New Zealand and says, gee, they've got a good taonga down there. Tēnā koutou katoa. ことにちちじかたんてかかかたんてほきはうちへもりよらいなまないなれよいがいびよてもとてのことてのことてのことかとあいやあんまあんまだ I am the facilitator for today. I am of Te Uruwera. I am Tamariki or uh, Tukuhu. I am a child of the mist. I am from Ruatuki and Waimana. Uh, <clears throat> Tame is my kin, is my benonga. I'm a little bit intimidated, to be honest, uh, uh, having to facilitate this uh, following uh, John Campbell. A uh, little bit intimidating because we've got a hell of a crowd. I'm a little bit intimidated because we've got such a great, switched-on, articulate, intelligent, intelligent panellists. And uh, then you've got Shane Tepo. But I'm going to give it my best. I did, I did learn uh, the art of kōrero and debate. And I think the uh, two greatest institutions, uh, the, the Flying Jug in Kōrero, uh, the Glue Pot Hotel in Auckland... And I look around and I see a few graduates from the Empire Tavern just up the road. 
Um, yeah, so I'm looking forward to this court at all. I'm, I'm going to lay out um, how we're going to proceed with today. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, my awesome panelists. They are Maori centric. They are Aotearoa centric, but they are also internationally acclaimed. So I think uh, Humai Te Paki Paki, we're very lucky to have them here today. <laughs> So what we're going to do is we go, I'm going to hand it over to Tummy first and work our way to the right. Um, just that's the, that's the order. I'm not talking about political uh, persuasions. <laughs> um, to, and have uh, my panellists introduce themselves if, uh, because they can do a much better job at that than I will. And then also to talk about our kaupapa. It's a very important one. It's a very timely one and it's very salient. And that is a te triti o waitangi what tango to whenua say. And uh, once we've uh, done that, we're going to have a little bit of a Q&A that I will lead. And then I'm going to open it up to the floor for about 20, 25 minutes. I'm going to take questions, not statements, uh, and allow people to, um, uh, to ask our panellists questions so we can get sort of uh, some good, some good kōrero going between uh, you, the audience, and... and uh, uh, me, the facilitator, and the panellist. And then we're going to end with a rollicking, great collective wayata. And we're going to, I've got some, uh, I've got some words and we're going to put it out and, uh, and we're going to give it our best go. So, uh, nō reira, it iwi a tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou kato, kia ora tame. Kia ora koutou, kia ora tātou katoa, e mihi kauatini a koe e te rangatila paura, a, nā mihi kia mātou, a keiru nei tēnei papa kōrero i tēnei aia. I'm, I'm assuming, you guys know a guy called Tom Poata. In, 19, in 1971-72, I met up with this guy called Tom Poata. He was the, uh, the guy who led a group called the Māori Organisation of Human Rights. And he was the guy that actually brought me to this place. And that was in 19, that was 50 odd years ago. Uh, it was a really interesting journey for me. That, that in those early years, it was, it was a really interesting, I mean, I was a young man. Uh, I was motivated. I was motivated coming from a little wee village in Uruatuki. I left home in 1968. And uh, I left home, I went to a place, I went straight down to Christchurch, just was just a whole different world for me in coming from the village. So you imagine this young Tuhoe boy going down there and over that period of time, so from 68 to 69 to 70, there are two places I need to go to. Shall I go to the right or shall I go to the left? Yeah, I kind of stuck to the right. So when you, when you stick to the right place, I thought I was at the right place. And, and so as time, life will lead you where you need to go to. Because everything I have learned is what I see and what I hear. So it wasn't really an easy journey to go through that period of time. So for me, I never really heard much about Waitangi. I had no really idea anything about Waitangi. But the conversation came through several times in different places. And so Tom Puata was the one that actually brought me here to this place. Because of the village down the road, there was a place they talk about there, the Kotahitanga movement, the first Māori parliament. And so that was really my first introduction. I didn't know anything about it. And so I met up with this whole lot of people. So this journey about this journey we're going to talk about today is really for me, my kōrero is around about, when, when you go through, you learn about this kōrero, for two way about that, for, for two way about the Tiriti of Waitangi, people will say, oh, two way didn't sign a treaty. Well, it's not the fact they didn't sign the treaty. Nobody turned up to Tuhoe to talk about the treaty. <laughs> yeah, nobody turned up. In fact, 
they did turn up there, the next door neighbors, with uh, Najiawa and Pukeko. They were down there. So apparently, our phenomena from just next door said to the guy, because they, they had contractors going around the country. And so they get all the signature and they can pay for it. And so apparently our neighbours say, don't go to those fellas down the road, you know, for whatever reason. So yes, we did not sign the, the, the treaty, not because we knew anything about it, and, uh, but that call that came across. Of course, my involvement with the treaty, and I can only talk about where, where I've been. And, um, and so when we talk about the treaty, and my first involvement with the treaty was either did a conversation with Tom Puata and joining up with Na Tamoto. In 1971, Na Tamoto went up to Waitangi. And, and I remember we just formed Na Tamoto down in Christchurch. And, uh, and I, I remember on the day on television, and they had a, a snapshot of Paul Kotara or Na Tamoto and neighbours trying to burn the flag or the New Zealand flag there uh, during that period of time. Yeah, so we had a look, hmm, that, that was really interesting, you know, and um, so for me is to try to understand what is this, you know, and still learning about that. So when you go through a whole period of time and learning all of those different quarter, the, the different narratives about the treaty and going back to the homeland and talk about the treaty. And... Um, so we, we kind of, two ways kind of sit aside. So we kind of sit aside, so, um, you know, the whole issue about how they're going to implement this whole Fakaro about the treaty. And um, so we decided to do some action about, to provoke some thoughts. So we decided that um, let's, have, let's have this conversation about, uh, about um, what happened 100 years ago. So with this very small exercise by issuing an eviction notice to everybody. So we came up with an idea. We came up with an idea, why don't we put a notice to everybody and give them a whole year. So we had these notice. Those of you who are residing on stolen land, we're giving you 12 months to vacate this place. So imagine receiving a mail in your mailbox. It drove them crazy. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the idea wasn't really trying to kick people out. The idea really to provoke people. What the hell are you talking about? To give us an opportunity. Because from their response, from the community, from those who responded who didn't like that whole little, was an opportunity for us still to have a conversation. So I am a great believer in that. I'm a great believer that we, we need, at times, what we need to provoke, to create a space for us to be able to have a quarter and have a chat, and rather than putting bullets on your head, you know, all that. And um, so I'm happy to just to stop here and give everybody else the opportunity and be part of this conversation. You can ask anything you want to ask. So kia ora tata. Oh, right. Well, um, our kahungunu ida tūroto and our ancestors' relations, nō kōnei, tēnā rākoutou. Papawai, you can be reassured your, your photograph hanging in the tuihiwi marae is safe and sound. Um, I want to get to the Papawai issue in a moment because I do think it's important. What those leaders did was fundamentally right on determining what Rangatiratanga was, but they had the wrong century. Um, so I want to move just a background where I'm from. I am from Tuahiwi, which is a village in North Canterbury. Properly, it's designated, it was originally designated at, as a reservation. Later, it became Reserve MR873. Māori Reserve land. But we actually grew up on a reservation, which is an interesting thing because it's a legal fact we grew up in a segregated society. And here's the thing, thank God for that. 
living in North Canterbury because um, the pa was really the place that held our tribe together because it was a culturally that place was who we were. Um, it started off guided by the Church of England, but we became Ratana. And the prophecy for the treaty in our people is driven from um, the Maanai and the idea of Te Omeka when it's our prophecy from the Maanai to resolve the issues of the treaty in the South Island. So that's really a background to who we were. And I think it's really important to understand as a legal fact, there is and never has been one law for all people. There's even a law for half-castes. Now, this whole idea of race we know is gen genetically meaningless. It has no basis in science, but it's reproduced as a meme all the time in society. Another fact I want to knock off before we get into the treaty stuff, because I know Moana and Tami are artists, so I'll do my job as a historian. Here's the thing about partnerships and the attempt to remove them. Partnerships appear in the Deeds of Settlement since 1998, 1,179 times. It's a legal fact. And unless someone's going to remove treaty settlements from the iwi, um, the idea of partnership as a treaty principle of, is there. Treaty principles appear 2,300 times within settlements. So I think we just need to put all the rhetoric aside and just deal with some facts. Um, I'm giving that background because I want to go straight to the idea that was posed about local government. Next fact before we get there is the tribe has always committed itself to a constitutional monarchy. And I want to make that point very, very clear. We have committed to a constitutional monarchy, not a republican monarchy. The last thing this tribe is going to commit to are what my father called 10 bob capitalists becoming the president. The tribe will never see them as e equals to our chiefs. So the point here is um, the reason why I think we need to understand what New Zealand's political system was rather than become caught in the political rhetoric of today. Constitutional monarchy is when the political system evolves slowly from the customs of that community. Now, anyone who knows the Westminster system knows it has evolved from custom. Common law has evolved from English custom. And, I mean, the idea of trusts, inheritance, comes from the period when knights during the medieval crusades put their wealth in trust so they could go to the Middle East and do what they did over there to the Muslims. Right? So... The idea of tikanga common law shouldn't come as any surprise because it's been here since day one. Um, but I want to go now to the point about local government. I think it's as simple as this. And here's an interesting statement from New Zealand Initiative. When Eric Crampton said, on reflecting on the Treaty of Waitangi after the 6th of February, he wrote an interesting article. His point was this. He can't imagine any Māori chief of that period going to a local government requesting permission to build a house. So what does rangatira tanga mean for our people? I think it's as simple as this. Regulatory authority over what we own and possess, financial jurisdiction, and the capacity to convert what we own into customary ngaitahu title with take whenua. Now, I just want to go through those. A good example is, um, you know, there's an insistency that we're all part of a grand democracy and we should all be part of that. That's never been New Zealand law. New Zealand law has always allowed Māori districts and areas to be set aside for themselves. Um, and that's certainly our village. We originally had the rights to raise revenue, which is liabilities, taxes and everything else. Governor Gray made the point when he set aside, set aside our reserve that we should have the right for taxation. Now, the reason why I'm getting there is um, following the earthquake, Christchurch City was built by Naito. All of those residential areas was built by the tribe. We housed the Christchurch population. 
Where did the rates and revenue go? It didn't go to any of our marae. If you go to our marae, we still don't get clear sewerage. A lot of them don't have sewerage, potable water, anything else. So, so there's a fundamental question on what happened to the GST rates and revenue. We don't get anything. And I think that's what you want, the right to decide what goes on your par and on the land that you now have off reserve. Because fundamentally I don't see why we don't have the right to do our own consenting processes and resource regulatory processes on our own terms. And I think that's the reason why Papua is quite important. When those rangatira came here in the 19th century, they were really passing legislation. But um, as Henry Searle said, back then we had, well, the, the government of the day was what he called ultra-democrats, which is a really interesting word. The government of the day were ultra-democrats, and I keep on switching that to ultra-nationalists. So, what they did back then is they fundamentally passed their own legislation on what they saw as important to them, and I really think that's the, the, the pathway other iwi and tribal groups will have to go. I don't think we can expect a clean answer all the way through because relationships aren't like that. But sooner or later, the boundaries between Rangatira Tanga and government have to be sorted. And, and I just remember a tangi held down at Morvan, what, my relation Kelly died in 2009, seven. There was a big debate, where are we going to put him? And um, someone with a planner's mind said, oh, we can't do this, we can't put him here because X, Y, and Z according to planning consents. Well, the Upoko and the tribe got together, Dad, Joe Walker from Tamuk, and they said, no, he's going right over there. And I think that's just a statement of an angateratanga. No one asked for a consent, and the council's never going to get in our way. And I think the reason why I came to that, after the earthquake, my, my mother, who's quite a big landowner in our village, she wanted to build a home back at home with cash, because she could. But of course, the council said, you can't. And she was tired. For 35 years, she hadn't been allowed to build in the par because of local regulations. So what mum did is she moved the house on there, dug a long drop, and she's, six, she's in her 60s. And of course, by the time she started that, the council started moaning about it and raising the red flags to us. We said, what are you going to do? She's heading into her 70s. She owns the land. She's put a house there. She's dug a long drop, and you're going to move her off. It's not going to look good in the press. Okay? So I think the question about Angateratanga is, I think the time's gone past when you ask the Crown to give it, and I think Willie Jackson said that once. I think it's being very clear amongst your own people where your authority starts and stops. I think it needs to be negotiated because we have to act with the Crown in good faith. But I'll put, I'll put this final question. What if a tribal corporation put aside a square kilometre of land, subdivided it, put their relations there, resolved the housing crisis? And they did it without the high transaction costs of local government and even the Crown. That's not a problem, that's a solution. And I think that's where we need to look. Oh, yeah. Okay. For clever, isn't he? Mm, represent red, white, and black from the abyss. Erupt like blue ape who cover the land like mist. Harma i te po, uri uri ki te omaroma. Hear the voice of Tipuna echo throughout the valley. Oh no, I was signed back in 1840. Kia ora. E mihi atu tēnei kia koutou. Uh, he hono re nui tēnei kia hau, tēnei uri no te waka o te aroa, no Ngāti Tūwhare tō, Ngāti Piki Ao Tūhaurangi, hoki a hau, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, thank you for your beautiful welcome, uh, Paura. I, got a, um, I uh, loved going out to the marae this morning, even though Paura uh, was um, marketed as a kaumātua, which I firmly reject, given we're about the same age. 
I'd, I'd just... I'd just like to say that, upon reflection, um, this couch is full of people who've been in my band. <laughs> this man, Te Maere Tau, and his uh, whānau, um, wrote, he wrote and performed a haka for a song that I wrote called Ancestors after we were driving around Canterbury. And he was, he was um, reciting some kind of way of turn, then looking at the landscape and blah, blah, blah. I said, what are you doing? He says, I'm trying to match the words of this waiata that, I, that came down to us with the landscape on the maps, you know, trying to match it with what our ancestors... And I went, oh, that's a neat song. Uh, OK, we're going to write the song. Walk the talk of my ancestors. And so he wrote the haka. And then this, this gentleman here, one day there was a knock at the door, and he said, can I come and stay with you? I went, OK. And... Uh, <laughs> And he came in and uh, stayed for a couple of weeks. And uh, oh, we were friends and um, people were looking for him. <laughs> he kept closing the curtains. I said, what are you doing? He said, nothing. I said, Tommy, did you pinch that thing? He said, I'm not saying anything. Anyway, I said, well, I'm writing a song about you and my friend, our friend Deirdre. It's called Moko. You might as well come and sing on it. So I took him to a, to a recording studio and we recorded the song. So he led the uh, revolution of reviving Tāmoko. So, uh, yeah, it's lovely to be sharing the couch with you too. Um, so Tu Whareto didn't sign uh, the treaty either, but there was this little out clause in the treaty. Ho ngā rangatira, o te oka mīnenga, me ngā rangatira kato ki hai, i uru ki taua waka mīnenga. All the chiefs in the confederation and those who aren't. Hello, how could you do something like that? You know? Uh, so Tuwharetō didn't sign it for the same reason that everybody else did sign it, to assert rangatiratanga. Um, to me, te tiriti, which I never really heard about when I was doing law, um, represents imagination, imagination and potential. Uh, and it represents relationships that are respectful and mana enhancing, as Moana Jackson would say, are inclusive, are future forward looking, and as Paula said, they, um, they denote collective responsibilities, not just about rights, but about duties, accountabilities, intergenerational responsibilities. Um, and, and they're about meaningful engagement. And that's where we are um, in 2024 with Māori particularly feeling frustrated uh, with the situation and a historical um, experience which is all about incremental incrementalism. So there has been a call, oh my God, a call for a debate about the treaty. Well, guess who's been debating it since February the 5th, 1840? It's just that there's, everybody else has turned a deaf ear or got historical amnesia or met that debate and those words with indifference, if not outright hostility. So the debate has been going on for a long time and there's a, just a couple of things that I want to um, kick to the curb. The mythology that Māori would ever cede sovereignty and complete power to a group of visitors who were a minority, come from afar, a little bit odd, um, and just go, oh yeah, hey, yeah. take on. over, it's all on. <laughs> go for it. Because, you know, our tribes would fight each other. You know, if somebody tried to move into your rohe, you'd fight, you'd scrap, that's how it rolled. So that is a myth. The myth that we see in sovereignty, I don't care how many politicians try to say it, they can go blue in the face, they often are blue in the face, um, it did not happen. It did not happen, okay? Um, the other thing that they try and say is the treaty... <laughs> the, the treaty is not about race. Well, none of us ever said it's about race. It's about nations engaging with each other. You know, 
So stop that kind of nonsense. So um, there, there's, a, there's quite a... Oh, and then I love the other one. I know, because I, I interviewed uh, Sir Michael Cullen. Gee, I liked him. Uh, on one, I know we had some dramas at Foreshaw and Seabed and all that stuff, but I quite liked him. Um, so one of the things that people like to say is that um, New Zealanders are not responsible for the actions of their ancestors. Um, well, that sort of dismisses the obvious that they're the beneficiaries of the actions of their ancestors. As Sir Michael Cullen said, much of what Parker enjoy today has been built on the back of explo exploitation and loss. Okay? So, so if we want to have a debate and we want to be, and we, if we agree, and I think we're in a time now, we're in a bit of a shocking, shock doctrine kind of a space where everything's going. Everything's like going off and we don't know where to look. Oh my God, there's climate, there's oil drilling, there's beneficiaries, there's all the stuff's going on. This is a perfect time for all of us to get together and think and be creative. Now, when I say that this debate has been going on for a long time, I'm going to finish off by a couple of little challenges that happen, and I was talking with Tummy about this yesterday, is that for a lot of us, we go, we were going treaty, 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 uh, we're going to take over, going to take over, we need to take over, and then one day we had this hui, and there was all these ma famous Māori activists there, and I, I was just sort of slunk in the room, because I wasn't anyone flash. Anyway, they're all really awesome and really brainy, and they said, so you see, so you had Hone Harawera in there and Tariana Turia and it's like, we had Parker ones in there too, uh, Jane Kelsey, a whole bunch, and they go, and then um, Moana Jackson and Rob Cooper go, just imagine, midnight, Māori are in charge. Now what? Well, what a bloody wake-up call that was. <laughs> Honestly. Honey goes, well, I think we should have a feed. <laughs> Maybe we put some of the politicians and some of the gangsters and a whole bunch of people on an island out there somewhere. Because we had to actually imagine. And one and Robert go, just imagine, Auckland, big city, lots of people, lots of immigrants. Uh, we've got foreign affairs and trade and everything's got to carry on. How do we end up being, uh, running the show so it's inclusive? So we don't become the oppressors. So we actually walk the talk of all these values that we talk about. Well, I mean, all those brainy people in the room, we struggled. But that was in the 80s, the late 80s. Tim Heide got me over to Stanford once to stand in for that flash judge who couldn't go. I mean, how flash was I? Asked the judge for notes. He goes, I don't do notes. Uh, anyway, he goes, can you come over? We've got this um, indigenous leadership um, hui over there and we've got kids from Alaska and Hawaii and Naitahu and you know just do something. I'm like oh god no pressure. Oh hang on I'll do this exercise. We got done. We, we had to do in the late 80s and so I told these kids hey okay you got 45 minutes. See how flash you are. Came back neat. Naitahu had it all sorted out. They looked at it, marae, it goes out into the community, goes up, goes along, goes up. Values driven, intergenerational, realising that humans are part of the ecosystem. It was just so exciting. So this is, this is the key message and the key time that for Pākehā, for Māori, for immigrants, for everybody to come together. We're at a crisis point, you know, with our planet, with our, our kids and everything. And the treaty, as Ngāhiwi Tōmwana says, is not a handbrake, it's an enabler. It's exciting. It's something to get excited about. There you go. Wow. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think we, we had a period of time, it's going to be an exciting time. Yeah, only uh, last year we came, we, we, well this year we come up with, a, with an idea and we put it out there on Facebook, on Instagram and to try and pull people. For those who want to have an experience with waitangi, come. 
Come and have the experience with Tamiichi and bring your white flag if they are there. So we work on that with our team, with my son here at the back there, put the strategy plan together, and uh, took us about two or three weeks, and people responded to that. Incredible. People responded to the call. And I think it's really important for us to, to make the shift to the move. Finally, as an artist, from an artist's point of view, we need to create a space to enable us to what move us. See, once upon a time, I used to think the enemy is blue eyes, blonde hair. And I came to, it took me a long time, mm, airhead, that's not right. Yeah. First, you've got to check out the enemy within and pull it. So it's really important for us to have him take those small actions that they're accused to share. He won't know. Don't talk me to Kaupapa. Kia ora, kia ora. Um, kia ora, kia ora, Tami. Our three panellists <clears throat> have, uh, for many years, have been uh, treaty activists and treaty educators. And I want to delve a little bit into the mahi that they do on a day-to-day -day basis um, in, in respect to the kaupapa. And I, I will start with you, Tami. Um, I'll just... Tami, you, uh, you tell a wonderful story uh, about going to the pictures, probably in Fakatane, because I don't think Urautuki's ever had a picture theatre. Well, I could be wrong. Tani Atua. Oh, they're flash because those fellows want Tani Atua. Anyway, you uh, tell a wonderful story about uh, going to the movies and having to sing God Save the Queen uh, when you were young. Our Tamariki don't do that now. Uh, whether they're brown, white, or somewhere in between, they sing beautifully our anthem in Te Reo and in English. Um, and that's where our kids are at. But what I want to ask you, Tommy, is when did you begin to form an understanding of Te Tiriti? Well, you know, you, know you, you, you go, you know, being brought up in the Ruatoki in the village and going to the Ruatoki Māori District High School, everything was created how to be a Pākehā. Nothing being tell us how to be too hoi. You learn that at home. At school was a whole, whole different operation. And so you go through there, very, you know, our uncles went to the, to, the, to the Second World War. So all that, everything at school was goals save the Queen, you know, all that, and how to be a Pākehā. And then you go to the movie, it's the same thing. So you walk into the picture theatre in Tane Atua, and then everybody had to stand up and sing God Save the Queen. And then when I went down to Christchurch in 1968, you go, you, you, I'm trying to process it. Who the hell is this queen? Who am I standing for? Why are we doing this? I'm talking to myself. But I'm... Um, other people were talking, my age group were also talking about that. Why are we in the Pākehā? So we're having that sort of kind of conversation. So there was a period of time where I thought, oh, I better go and check it out. So I had a chat with some of the guys from Ngāpuhi, from Ngāti Pro. So this was in Christchurch. So we decided, let's go and check it out, see what happens. We all decided not to stand. And so we went to, you know, to the square, uh, to the Civic Theatre, and we, we, had, we had no plans to go and watch the movie. We just go on to go in there and see what's going to happen. So we walked in, the three of us, and we sat in there, and then they played God Save the Queen, and everybody stand up. Then all of a sudden, go, hey, stand up. They were very quite aggressive. Uh, you're talking to a 17-year-old, mm. and, and they're very aggressive. They just kind of pick us up and pull us up. He's a big guy, then we end up in a fight. It's part of that exercise for me is to check myself out, for all of us. You know, where is this taking us to? You know, and, um, and, and, and I think for me is going, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to work out, who am I? What the hell I'm doing here? You know, you, you almost kind of work it out. You know, this, when, when, when everything is geared up how to be a Pākehā, you know, it is quite confusing. 
for a 17-year-old. And uh, I didn't have a voice. And it took me a long time. And I had difficulties having that. I, I couldn't have a conversation like I am now at, at that time. So when the first thing I did when I got to crisis was just to learn how to speak your language. Yeah, I can read. I can kind of write, but having a conversation like this is a whole type different exercise altogether. And so for me, it's just to, to try and understand that. And uh, yeah, yeah, so that's the story about that. Hey, uh, kia ora, tami, tamari. <clears throat> You've always been uh, steeped in uh, tikana or kawa of your hapu and your iwi. Uh, how I'm putting in terms of the treaty, the treaty process and where we're at is the, uh, is the uh, self-empowerment of our haukainga, of our hapu and of our iwi. Um, look, I find this <laughs> really interesting. I've never been an activist. Um, and it's just... Pardon? You're an academist. Yeah, an academist. Well, yeah. I, I do remember at home they, there was a request to our to our upoko at home, um, whether we'd march one year. And I remember the community got together and said no, because no one had asked us properly. We just got a letter. And we wanted to make sure that the komatwa were asking us. Look, I'm just framing this for you, because I never was that. But um, in I was quite young when my father filed the Ngaitahu claim. And before that, he'd been involved in the Tuihi decision. And I remember that. I was at high school and a chap from the North Island came and wanted the right to take power from Waipara, which is where our families go. He was there, mum and us were fuming at the back thinking, what the hell's dad doing? Um, but it ended up really quite good and that's where we saw change from my experience happening because conservative Christchurch of all places, the Tewehi decision and the right to get shellfish in a customary manner came from there. And then Dad filed the Ngaitahu claim two years later, and I was still at university, and they just roped me in to help because there was no one else, really. That's what happened. But it was fascinating to go through the political system then and to watch because what I found interesting is how that system works. And let's be frank, it's, it's not as neutral and unweighted and free as open as we all believe. You know, um, Whiskey and cigars still count. And what I also noticed, and I sometimes watched my father finding, because he was a freezing worker and from home and everything else like that, but he was also from the university, he sometimes struggled to see the conventions operating within parliament. But what we saw are ways to change through that political system, and I noticed you have to understand the mechanisms of government and local government. And it's a fascinating thing, and I think sometimes which is why I'm heading into the detail now. As far as I can see it, Rangatira Tang is regulating, regulatory control over what you own on your reserves and having full authority. It also means getting the revenue through. And your title should be customary. The idea of the British monarchy doesn't bother me because I'd far rather the Westminster political system, and, and I'll explain why. One of the most important things that came out of the Westminster system was the Religious Toleration Act, which is a fascinating thing. If you go to Oxford, where Willie's going, get someone to show you where Queen Mary burnt all the people <laughs> they were on the other side of things. So the idea of toleration is really quite an important thing. But it evolves through the Westminster system. And um, we're quite clear. So the battles from us is negotiating, and it will be in the Crown, where the Crown's authority is and where's ours, where ours starts. It's never going to be simple. And I'll just give an example. Historians always talk about this thing called the 1967 Māori Affairs Amendment Act. It's actually more devastating than anyone will ever imagine. In 1968, my baby's family were having a debate on how they would subdivide the land to build, because everyone in the park built it on their family land. The council came in and said, under this act, we've rezoned you out. No Māori now can build in the park. Here's the way they justified it. They brought in my neighbour, who was the nicest neighbour. <laughs> Mr Gilman was his name. And um, 
He said, on this block of land, I get 40 cents a bale of hay. Last year I got 1,100. This year I'll get between 1,700 to 1,900 bales of hay. Consequently, the whole of the pa was rezoned rural. If you go through Tuahiwi now, everyone's just finished hay baling. We're really a place for the Māori trustee and leaseholders and everything for um, the rural family sector, those rural sectors to farm our land for hay bales. Who sat on the county council when that law was passed? Who's the biggest landowners in our village? following 19, the 1967 Māori Affairs Amendment Act. But you can get angry about it, but there's gold there as well. Because really what the county, the county council had was regulatory authority passed to them from the Crown. They could take your land. Simple as that. And all we want to do is take back that land, have the right to put housing there, have the right to get the taxes, and if our tribe is one of the biggest infrastructure builders in the South Island, as well as one of the biggest housing zoning, um, you know, residential zoning um, companies in the South Island, we'll take the rates and the GST and plough it back into our villages and where we want. That's how I see Ranga Teretanga, putting body to those things. And in the end, I think we'll probably move towards establishing, I'm going to say, Anything I say here is not going to court. <laughs> so anything I say is not going to court. In the end, the idea of reasserting your customary title as opposed to crown title is a thing Māori should look at. And it's as simple as that from my end. I know it's different from Moana and Tame, but it's because of the circumstances down home. Of course. Kia ora. <laughs> Moana, we all love uh, the Americanization of, 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 of music here in Aotearoa. Uh, it's it's uh, deeply embedded in, in how we enjoy our music, um, and we were sold on it. But rather than being swept away, your good friend Dalvanius Prime, and then yourself, you moulded uh, the two together, and you sung about protest, and you sung about activism, and you sang about the importance of our reo. How did that manifest itself? How did it come about, Mona? When I was at university, I studied law. I only asked one question in constitutional law. They never asked. Back in those days, the lecturers, professors would ask everybody a question. Mr Brown, what do you think about this? Well, they never asked me because my name is Maniaputo, okay? That was going to be too torturous for them. <laughs> one day I said, excuse me? What about the treaty? And the professor went, oh, the, the treaty? Well, that's not relevant unless it's in a piece of legislation. And I thought, gee, that doesn't sound right. I'm only a year one uh, law student. Um, I ended up going into the classes run by our friend Jane Kelsey and David Williams and learnt about how law and justice aren't necessarily related. I mean, what a, I mean that was real stink. I was going to be like the splash lawyer. And then I went, I don't think I can handle this. I came out of law school and myself and Barbara Menzies, another Pākehā ally, spent two years developing a resource with these wonderful mentors like Rob and um, Honeka and um, uh, um, uh, Rua Arakina and Joy Arakina from Taranaki. And they and we did these journals on looking at colonisation, the tools of colonisation, law, church, uh, economics, uh, what happened with the land. We did these ten journals. This was two years of you know like total immersion. So coming out of that and then seeing my mates who were involved in health, justice, uh, politics, we're like a squadron. You know, I'm in the arts and music. I think, well, I'll do the sound bitey stuff. Won't go away, treaty won't go away. Okay, you're in health, you do the, hey, hang on. 
the fire order is not, fatu order is not working, we need the Aka fire order. Uh, urine justice, criminal justice system is not neutral, is not uh, values free. Uh, your Māori son is more likely to get picked up by the cops than your Pākehā one, and this is a fact. Um, so, you know, our friends were right across the spectrum. Uh, and so it's easy if you're, if you're locked into uh, some amazing networks, and, and music has given me that kind of um, uh, t um, ability, to sort of just become part of the group. And, and music and arts can be a real powerful way to get complex ideas to land. A -e -i -o -u. How do you pronounce their language? Just, you know, a -e -i -o -u. instead of torturing people with a lecture, even though I love historians and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, there's, <laughs> there's different ways that we do things. Uh, and, you know, I think that everything that I've done is just to try and help people connect the dots. You know, connect the dots between what's going on and their lives and what's and what's preventing that reaching the full potential you know and we're at uh, um, some of us uh, do a lot of things behind the scenes too where we you know we're working trying to develop TT centric relationships with government ministries I mean I should just sit here and knock myself out like this because it is so torturous it is unbelievably torturous. But we carry, and then just when we get to the end, we go, I'm not going to do it anymore. Then one of our lot will go, it's not about you, Petal. <laughs> carry on. And we carry on. But we're building allies along the way. We're building allies along the way. Because a lot of non-Māori can see the value in manākitanga, whanaungatanga, kaitiakitanga, so we carry on. And what we need are more Pākehā allies and champions. Kia ora. That's it. That, incredibly, incredibly, that brings me to the next question, uh, Tame. Um, uh, <clears throat> I want to roll off a few names, and you know them well. Some of them are, are in this room. Dennis O'Reilly's in this in the whare today. Sue Bradford spoke earlier, but we talk about our good friend John Minto and uh, Jane Kelsey and Kevin Haig, long-term supporters, long-term ally of allies of Te Triti. On your journey, how important have our Pākehā allies been, Tame? Uh, really, really important that we, um, we can pull together. But how do we do that? I guess the question is how we're going to be able to, uh, to, to approach our, you know, our park, our friends, our treaty friends. And, and I, I think there's a different layer. So we just got to get over our own hang ups, you know, and, and set aside our own, our wana wana. So I too had to let go of that. I had to let go of all of the different, the different layers. And, um, and I think that um, the safest place for me as an artist is to be able to, to create creating space to enable us to, to find a pathway, either through music, having a kai, go for a swim, share the space, or come to, let's have a cup of tea together, and, and pulling that together. And, um, yeah, it's a long journey, but I think it's, in a, it's also in exciting times for us there to, to be engaged, just like here. Look, look at your face. They're all here. And it's, I think it's really important for us to have this conversation and to share those moments. And we do need it right now. Kia ora, Kia ora Tami. Hey, Tamari. Um, look, I get the view, I get the sense that the many that are opposed to the use of our language and our tikana and our culture were, were uh, uh, and for want of a better term, but an accurate description, an older group of Pākehā men, all due respect to the very good Pākehā allies that we have here, <clears throat> but uh, a sense of their loss of their own power. But when we look at our, look at our tamariki, uh, we see that they are very, whether they're Māori or non-Māori, they're very at 
piece where, where our language is at, where our culture is at. It's their secondary nature. Does that give you hope, Tamari? Yeah, but I don't see it like that. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you how I see it. I think um, there's a couple of things going on with this regime at the moment, and it's almost as if they want to go back to the 1950s, Sid Holland era. Now, what I've noticed and the tribes have noticed is we've always had very good relationships with the wider Pākehā community, younger or, or older. What we've found is it's usually the culture... Oh, I'm going to sound like an elitist, but the Pākehā community who knows their identity. And Christchurch is an interesting place. They're full of hard socialists. They're full of landed gentry. And, but they know who they are and they know their values, and both groups have always supported the tribe and engaged right throughout. The tribe's relationships will always be for the benefit of the South Island, whether it's Ngaitohu, but we have to do it with the rest of the South Island communities. Um, and just an example of what happened last year, I, I have a friend who was at Taitapu, but we negotiated with the Wakefield family, a Ngaitohu, really falls under my hat, Zu Pogon Han, and the Wakefield family for a scholarship at Oxford University. Now, we all know our past histories, but we're, we're all knowledgeable enough in our own cultures to understand each other. And I remember having a, oh, he was fascinated, he was just talking to me about this wine he got from the German side of the Muse or Musel River, I don't know the difference. But it's one of those things. And I was going on about the difference between the white bait out of the Ashley and the Waimakariri, because you can taste the difference, right? <laughs> That's culture. And as long as everyone's tolerant and shows an appreciation of the different aspects of culture, fine. It's the difference between... No, I'm not going to be a snob about this. But, um, you know, we have more tear tear that are really quite beautiful. But there's other things that we've inherited culturally, that are also that. And I think it's, it's cultural appreciation without attacking the other side, but knowing very clearly who you are, you are and your identity. Harry Everson was our historian for the Ngaitahu claim. I think he was really quite disappointed when we became a corporation because he was hard socialist. But, you know, um, he understood who the tribe was and, he appreci and we appreciated Harry. Does this answer the question? Well, yes, it does. Uh, and just... Uh, so, so what yep. does concern us mm -hmm. is I've noticed in Christchurch when factions come through, they have no understanding of the history of Christchurch. Yes. They have none, no understanding of the culture of Christchurch, but they very clearly have an understanding of what they don't like. But I can't see an appreciation that they show of their own culture. Kia ora. Mona, um, <clears throat> I ask question question to tell me about our Pākehā allies and it's been something that you've been recently champion but also another constant in uh, Te Tiriti and the movement over the last 50 years is an understanding and a, <clears throat> a showing of mutual love for other indigenous and oppressed people throughout the world whether it be the anti-apartheid movement uh, our support for uh, Northern Ireland um, uh, <clears throat> what we see in Australia, just forever, basically. Um, and we watch in horror that grows on a daily basis what's happening to our Palestinian sisters and brothers in Gaza. All of the, all of the, all of the people I've just outlined have also been very supportive and active in their support for us as Tangata Whenua. What's been your experience and your views on that issue, Mona? As a musician, I've been very privileged to travel the world and engage with many, many different communities and nations that um, musicians who aren't singing about the same sort of things that we perform about would, have, would ever have that opportunity. Sami people up in the Arctic, um, performing in Russia, um, in Vladivostok and Moscow and places like that, in Borneo around the rainforest. 
in, in Germany where you think, these people, how, how's any of these people going to relate to us? Well, they relate to us, many of them, because they have a, an experience of colonisation, of disempowerment, people in Taiwan, Taiwanese uh, indigenous tribes, Sami people up in Norway, Finland and Sweden, um, Australia, of course, Afanonga there. And so, and they look at us, it's quite interesting because they look at us and they go, wow, look at you, you've got your language, you've got a, a Māori television channel, you've got tribal radio stations, you've got this and that. And I go, you know what? Wasn't handed on a plate. A lot of people spend a lot of time and energy fighting to get that, going to court, going to tribunals, marching, protesting, uh, so that we fought for this. But there, there are these really strong relationships, and, and um, uh, you know, Timaire has grown those relationships with his students. Um, I, I have, you know, working on music with different um, vocalists from different communities, the language is endangered. But I think that there's just this natural kind of relationship that develops uh, with whānau from those different countries. And it, it always makes you realise that, um, and, and they used to say that to, to me when I'd go to these different places, uh, like Inari, it's a tiny little village, you know, 800 kilometres inside the Arctic Circle. And um, they say, you know, you make us feel not alone. Lovely, eh? Awesome. You know, and you go, awesome. yeah, 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 we've got a big team. We've got a big team. Okay, let's share some. Let's plot. Yeah. Let's share some secrets and some ways forward. Awesome. Hey, we've got about 20 minutes. I do want to give Val, our whānau here, the opportunity to ask a couple of questions now. I don't know, is Warren Maxwell in the whare at the moment? Oh, my goodness. Is Warren here? Kia ora. Oh, hey, Warren. Warren's the speaker pro tem of this whare, so he sorts out the uh, questioning rules. And he told me, yeah, questions are good, Shane, but uh, no, keep this, no statements and no supplementaries, all right? <laughs> so that's the only, uh, that's the only co-papa that I'm, I'm going to lay down. So let's get uh, a mic down here and a mic down there. And I'm probably only going to take two or three questions. And then, at the same time, can we hand out the words to our waiata? <laughs> and I'm going to organise <clears throat> a super group. For that wire to up here, so we're going to get Warren Maxwell up he's, here. He's morphing into Bruce Springsteen. Look at him! Look at we're him! We're going to get Bruce from Fat Foodie's Drop, Trinity Down Roots, Little Bushman. How how good can we get, man? How good can we good can we get? So uh, we'll get that little super group together. But uh, but let's uh, get some questions going. Just raise your hands if you uh, would like to ask a question. The, the Matua over here has a question. Okay. Yes, it's coming. I know I sound purist. Here's a scenario. You build your house on your land. I'm next door and I put a mushroom factory on it and the smell of that blows into your village. I'm exercising my right, you're exercising your right. How do we resolve the issue under your culture? Yeah, I, I think I understand. Um, our view is, the difference is our land was reserved to be regulated by our village, okay? So how you do the zoning is going to be a question we will probably look at a zoning area within, sorry, a, an industrial area within the village. But I think the fundamental point to your question, um, what no one's covered over all these five decades, four decades, five decades, is the whole cost that our people have had to carry for your right to build there. So what really happened is our people had to sell their land because they weren't allowed to build there. So in the 60s, they were removed, they were prohibited, which meant by the 1980s, the village I grew up was in full of old people. I never knew why we had so many comas, but now I know why. Their children had to move out. When their children moved out, they were isolated in a rural area with no health, 
transport because the buses and the post office were all closed down under the Labor government. So they only had one option, they sold. Who'd they sell to? Who would you sell rural Māori land to that has no residential value, you can't subdivide and build? They sold to the people who passed the regulations which were the county council people. So that whole situation has evolved to the disaster it is. But I think what we need is our regulations for our land. Now, the question is for yourself. The resolution we have at the moment is that the rural zoning that the council passed remains for yourself. Okay. And I think that was the best compromise we could get, but sometime this is going to drive us together where we will have to figure out the zoning regulations. Our only concern is what really happened is that as soon as we got the right to build, everyone else wanted the right to sell their land and to build in the village. So our point is to go back to the first reserve regulations where it said land should not be sold outside of Māori. And that's simply the legislation established by the governor during that period. Do we have a question on this side? We have so I want to be clear yep. on that, that point. Go. I want to be absolutely clear. At the moment, the resolution is our rights are unique to the descendants of the original owners. The local government regulations apply to everyone else. Thank you, Tamari. We've got a question over here. What's, what strategy would the panel propose for dealing with David Seymour's ill-conceived attempts to devalue the treaty? Ah, the question was, what, uh, do, what, uh, how do you see uh, us addressing the issue of uh, David Seymour's um, policy push to devalue the treaty? <laughs> well... Well, I went through, treaty principles are there in legislation, I think, 2,300 times. The partnership there appears just under 1,200 times. Yeah. So, as a fact, as a fact of law, partnership and treaty principles are there. In the Ngaitahu one, we are the only tribe with an explicit statement because I wrote it. And the Crown recognises Ngaitahu as holding rangateratanga. You can't walk this back. I think that what he wants to do, though, mm. is um, that, that, that they, they see treaty settlements as something separate to everything else. So they mm. want to get rid of um, treaty principles that might be, I remember they first came up in the State Owned Enterprise Act, might be in education, whatever. That's what they want to do. They want to, they want to well, New Zealand first wants to go into each act, mm. all those, mm. you know, that data that you've collected, and be very explicit about what those principles are. Um, David Seymour wants to basically rewrite the treaty um, to, to um, get rid of any indigenous kind of voice in anything. Um, what you need to understand in terms of the treaty principles is that the treaty principles are, um, were put into legislation to really acknowledge the breaches, potential breaches by the Crown without addressing the elephant in the room, which is sovereignty. Mm. That, so a lot of us, over the years, we don't use this phrase, treaty principles. We just talk about the articles. Mm. Te tiriti, as I said to the Prime Minister when I did my interview with him. What is in te tiriti? And we went back and forth, obviously, on the wrong, you know, not understanding each other. Um, so the principles are much less than what the articles represent, which is about tinoranga tiratanga. It's about what... Timari was talking about, and it is it is um, this effort to rewrite um, the treaty to even um, demean it and undermine it even more has been um, the subject of much intense kotahitanga, irote te ao Māori. That's what happened at Tūranga Wai Wai, Waitangi, Ratana. There's another one coming up in the Hawke's Bay. I mean, it's the Ngāti Tōa was on the steps the other day at, uh, at Parliament. Hey, I mean, this is hammer time, honestly. Yeah. But. Mm -hmm. I hate that word. <laughs> yeah. What do you mean, but? But. <laughs> I haven't heard a coherent argument in statement from ACT. 
Mm. And just on the... There's no coherence. Yeah. Stop it. <laughs> It's a faux bullshit culture war they're trying to start that if I don't think be, uh, Kiwis buy into that shit, to be honest. See, if we're going to be tolerant, yeah. I'd actually mm. like to listen to what they really have to say mm. because you can figure out nonsense yeah. from stuff straight away. Mm. But I've actually heard political phrasing and statements that don't make mm. sense. They don't make sense. Yeah, I know that, but I'd like to hear something that does mm. so that we can argue properly. I tried to, I tried yeah. to interview them. Mm. And it is so torturous. Yeah. You know, I, I, I love this last panel that John was, um, was convening uh, with um, Sue and Co, because the, the word, the, the phrase data and evidence popped up. Mm. I thought, well, that's, that's meaningless hey. at this point, because no one takes it seriously. Tommy, I'm really interested. Thank, thank you for that, Moana. Um, I'm very interested in your court at all here. You've been an activist. You're almost, I think you're 70 now, eh, Tame? 73. This, 72, sorry. 72. This year, folks, uh, he publishes his memoir. I reckon it's going to be a great read, but uh, he, he said it's not going to be a memoir. He said it's going to be a manifesto. I look forward to that. What's it called? What's yeah. it going to be called? What's it going to be called, Tame? What's your manifesto going to be called? Your manifesto, what are you going to call it? Mana. Mana, love it. But anyway, you've, you've seen the David Seymours over the years. You know, you've seen the Muldoons. You've seen them all come and go to three to endures. What's your approach to, to this lot, uh, Tommy? They're only around the short term. I mean, I, I don't take them people seriously. Because why do you take dumbass like that <laughs> seriously? It's not worth listening to. We just carry on. I mean, I, I need to respond to their dumbass thought. It's but more important what we're going to do about it. Where are we going? More about working with the community, with the whanau, with the hapu, and us, the nation, Aotearoa. So, uh, waste of time having a debate and having a conversation about dumbass. <laughs> Can I can I take one more question from the floor? And then I have a quick fire question to our three panellists. One more question from the floor, please, on the left. Kia ora. Um, in view of Te Tani Fa Upoko Toru, um, have you each got a word of hope looking forward, knowing that we're facing clocks being turned back after many years of work? Sorry, that's a statement. But um, do you have... What gives you hope looking forward? And does anything give you hope? I'll, I'll give you one word. Oh, actually, it's two. Ao <laughs> tamariki. Yes. There's a huge hope I can see there with, my, with the mokopuna. There's a new generation. You know, and, uh, and having people like my mokopuna, I've been working with him. And, and there's a huge population of that generation. And then and I think having a conversation, ongoing conversation, and uh, actually I'm really excited what the future is going to look like because uh, there is an opportunity for us there to create the magic. Te Mare, what gives you hope? Oh, experience gives me hope. Look, we went through this in the, the 80s. ACT came out of labour, remember? Yes. And we got through the 80s, we Sorry. got through the 90s. Yeah. It's, this is just tied yeah. in, tied out. Mm. Yep. Mona? Well, actually, looking out here gives me hope. Yeah. It really does. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I thought I've never been to Featherston before. Yeah. Shame on myself. <laughs> yeah. You... I know. I thought it was in Wellington. Yeah. <laughs> and then they said to me, we'll give you a rental. I said, well, just Uber. <laughs> and then me and Sue Bradford, you know, drove for blooming hours over that hill and she said, pull over to the left, they'll go psycho. You know, so these, these cars are like, eh, eh, eh. <laughs> anyway, I get here and I think, wow, I'll go to the lovely hotel. Oh, this is very colonial, isn't it? Uh, very beautiful, nice venison kai, by the way. Um, but, you know, looking out here gives me hope. That you all came today to hear us talking about the Tiriti. Now, I must say, I did say to Shane, hey, that Julian Bachelor lot's not in here, I think. <laughs> you know, you get a little bit worried now. Yeah. So that gives me hope. Going to Waitangi, 
and, and um, interviewing the likes of Honia Harawira and Margaret Mutu and Maui Solomon and everybody up there. And, and I mean, I was totally depressed. Go, you know, I'm going up there, thinking, oh my yeah. God, this is shocking. Yeah. I go, Honia, what do you reckon? How are you feeling? I'm feeling hopeful. Yeah. You're kidding me. Mm. Margaret Mutu, how are you feeling? Oh, I'm feeling hopeful. Yeah. David Seymour is mobilising us. <laughs> it's good to have You know? And then, and then I think, and then I've got my, my lovely, my lovely, uh, you know, neighbor, park our neighbours in, in their mid 70s coming across and they're going, Wana, Wana, you just yell, yell out, we're going to protest. All the conservatives, even some of the, my conservative national voting friends are like, what's going on is incredibly radical. We've got to get together. I reckon we're on a roll. We are. We are on a roll, and you know what? That's a good way to end it. It to everybody. Let's get our super group up here, man. <laughs> With Warren Maxwell. Oh, wow. Oh, we'll give it All right, yeah. when you're two, ready. Two, two, two. Yeah. I'm just so happy to see uh, ooh, all this awesome stuff happening here in Featherton, like our sister Moana said. So uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll have a crack at this, eh? Kia kaha, kia kaha no. Hapoi. And then we'll finish off uh, Whaka Kapi after, eh? Kapai pai. Here we go, here we go. Ha uh, ki roto. Big breath in. Ooh, ha ki waho. Here we go. Nga iwi e, nga iwi e ki a kotahira te mana muiti wa. Nga iwi e, nga iwi e ki a kotahira te mana nui a ki wa. E, ia, ia, wakarongo tautoko. E, ia, ia, ia. Ooh, sounded good, eh? Tiha, ki a maura, ki a maura, ki te mana motu hake me te aroha. Ki a maura, ki a maura, ko te mana motu hake me te aroha. Eh, ia, ia, hakarongo tautoko, tu, eh, ia, 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 wahine, wahine ma, wahine ma, maranga tui, manu mai, ya maura, wahine ma, wahine ma, maranga mai, maranga mai, Kia kaha, e ia ia, fakarongo tau toko, e ia ia. Naiwi ya, naiwi e, e tama ma, tama tu, tama ora, tama ora, e tama ma, e tama ma, tama tu. Tamahora. <laughs> 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 Me a tata fai na tika ngā rata mā kua wehe. Kia mau, kia ita, e koera, korea i ngaro, kia pūpuri whaka mau a kia tīna. Haumi e, hui e, tāki e, nā mi. Kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora. Niti, niti a mi. Nā mi, tēnā koe wā. Excellent. Ooh, inspiring. Oh, my.